Today, we're going to, the, the, the title of the message today is Resurrection is the main influence in my divine influence. Amen. Resurrection is the main influence in my divine influence. By way of foundation scriptures, the first scripture will be found in Genesis chapter 33. And from 33, Genesis chapter 37, 33 to 35. Genesis chapter 37. Yes. And it's the story, as you know, uh, Joseph has been sold into slavery. And the Bible says, from verse 34, 33, yes. And he recognized it. I'm talking about uh, Jacob. He recognized it and said, It is my son's tunic. A wild beast has devoured him. Without doubt, Joseph is turned to pieces. And Jacob tore his clothes and put sackcloth on his waist and mourned for his son many days. Verse 35. And all his sons and all his daughters arose to comfort him but he refused to be comforted and said, For I shall go down into the grave to my son in mourning. Thus his father wept for him. Praise the Lord. And the next one is in Romans. Romans chapter 1 verse 4. Romans chapter 1 verse 4. And declared to be the son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by resurrection from the dead. Declared. In fact, some of your Bibles will say designated. Some versions will use the word determined. But we'll come back and deal with that later. That this Christ is designated to be the son of God. Son of God. Accord, uh, with power according to the spirit of holiness by the Holy Spirit. Praise the Lord. There's a picture that I asked uh, that we put on in the, first, uh, in the first service, and if you can do that in this service, it will help a lot. And it was a picture as I was preparing this um, for this message, and I was reading through and fro in the life of Joseph and how he affected the, the people in his life. I remembered that many years ago, and chances are some of the people who have graduated from um, the youth club ministry in those days who are here might remember. That year, a lot of what we were dealing with was about New Horizons. And I remember that year I was preaching a word called New Horizons in the context of young people. And we had a guy in the group who was a very good artist, a very good artist. So we were, we were just, you know, trying to be creative around young people. So I told him to get the whiteboard and I gave him a pen and... I said, listen, this is a new horizon. And as I'm preaching, I want you to just begin to draw. Just begin to draw what comes to you about new horizon. And I remember some of the things I was talking about was the vistas and things like that. And I didn't even have anywhere close to what I'm about to talk about. But, you know, whatever I said. And he, he drew something similar. Obviously, it was, this is a picture of some sort of maybe a, a professional artist of some sort that almost looks real. But what he drew was a man standing on a cliff. And you could see there were mountains in the vista. Just as you can see, like, you can almost see that, you know, you can't see the end of it. All you can see is the sun setting or maybe the sun is rising. Whatever the case is, you're almost seeing towards the ends of the world. And, and this is uh, what this, and this, this young child was able to draw. Gave, and, and, I thought, what? and we all collapsed. We were all excited because you just brought the message alive. That in God, you know, there's a, in where we talk about new horizons, it's not about the past, it's about the great things that God has got way out there planned for us. And, and I began to think about that. You know what, where we are as a church, new wine, God is doing great things, God is doing new things, amen? And that there's great vistas ahead of us, amen? So you know what, I began to remember what he talks about, and then I got excited about one of the scriptures that I've been excited about quite recently, 
like never before, which is in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 17 and 18. It says that Christ may dwell in your heart by faith. The element of faith is, which by, is that thing by which Christ dwells in our heart, that you being rooted and grounded in love. Guess what? This is the house of God. And in this place, there is love. When we come together, the love of God is intensified. We're going to talk about that intensification later, a little bit later. But he says that that will be rooted and grounded in this place of love that may, that may be all, may be able, that we the saints may be able all together to comprehend the breadth. Can you imagine that picture that we saw earlier? The breadth of the land, the length of the land, the depth of the water bodies or the valleys in that land, and the height of the mountains where the, and the, 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 the height that of that, of, in that land. And Daniel called to me that for the people of Israel in those days, the promised land was the representation of God's all-inclusive blessing. So in that land, when they got there, they talked about the fact that it was full of milk and honey. But can you imagine the breadth of that land? Can you, the breadth of the land was so big that at least 12 tribes were able to divide it among themselves. The breath of the land. In fact, we know for a fact that some, those of us who have been to Israel, you can remember as we were driving, we, one day we were driving to, from uh, Jordan to, to, to for lunch, and it was forever. And we were driving on mountains and cliffs. And you could see mountains and vistas, and they would tell us, this is Mount this, the Mount that. That was the all-inclusive land that he enjoyed. The water body, the one, I mean, in fact, they had the lowest, in fact, Jericho is considered to be the lowest depth on the, on the, here on the face of earth. So they had enjoyed the depth, the land. But guess what? For us, the New, New Testament believers, Christ is our all-inclusive land. Can you imagine when Paul is writing, he says, listen, if only you knew that as a company of believers, especially here in New Wine Church, there is such a land that you should be grounded and rooted so that when you walk in the vistas of Christ, there's an unending vista in depth and breadth and length and, and height. Amen. Christ is our all-inclusive land. So in this season, we must stop looking on the outside for that promised land. For that convenience. Because, listen, we already have it on the inside of us. We already reside in Christ. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. And that is what excites me. But the question is, you see, these things that we have can only be discerned spiritually. You can almost look at what you're going through physically and you would miss it. We could look around the room and now and look at it in, in the physical eyes and miss what God is, God's moves in this season is all about. No wonder in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, we say, but the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. Praise the Lord. So here you are, you might think you have a challenge at home. But if your natural mind is what's leading you, your natural eyes is what's perceiving, that's all you see. But is it possible that God has a bigger plan? God is using that look that the enemy is setting in front of you for his own purpose and his own plan. In first, that same first Corinthians in chapter 2 verse 10, it will talk about the fact that no man has seen with their eyes. No man has aired with their ears. Neither has he dropped into the hearts a thing that God has laved up for those who he loves. But one thing he does say, though, it is perceived and received by the Spirit. Ladies and gentlemen, in New Wine Church, where we are now, we have to walk in the Spirit. Amen. We, not, we need to perceive in the Spirit. We need to be communing with the mingled Spirit of God inside of us to be able to know what God's move for the now is. Amen. Don't look at what's around you and, and make a determination. Don't look about what you're, what's in your account and make a determination. I mean, pastors taught us we are chosen. So God has not chosen us for negativity. Amen. He's chosen us to bless us. Amen. 
But you see, among the chosen, if they're all they're thinking about is their own convenience, among the chosen, if all they do, can perceive is their natural eyes, they will miss the move of God. And my prayer is that in this season, you will not miss the move of God. Because this is the house of God, the church of God, the house of the living God. Amen. The foundation and the pillar of truth. Amen. And today, are we going to enter such into such a truth? Amen. So the thing, what, is my, what is my admonition this morning? This morning, ladies and gentlemen, I am trusting God that God is going to open us up as a company of believers into his set now move for New Wine Church. If, today, if this year that he gave our man of God is divine influence, year of divine influence, then by faith we will walk with God by his leading according to this church and according to his people. Praise the Lord. We will, we will stop looking at the things in the natural, but rather we will be spiritually minded. And this is where it starts today. I've got two stories that I'm going to use to explain this truth about the power of resurrection. Now, one of the things I've come to realize as I began to read more about Joseph's life is that by reading his life, you do not get this, the real sense of his day-to-day -day living. You get the fact that he had a dream, then he had a second dream, and then he... Uh, he had to go, I mean, I mean, see what we were thought last week, that in all of what Joseph, to activate his breakthrough, two key things, obedience and going the extra mile. But you see, nowhere does the Bible say, guess what, this was obedience and this is where extra mile is. We have to tease it out through the spirit, amen. And we thank God for the spirit of God upon this house. Because you can get excited about divine influence, but miss out the truth that has been seeded in there. So today we're going to do one of the one. We're going to try and tease out more. Now, the, the, both stories are in the Old Testament. The first one is still with, is, is, is from the foundation scripture that I read. In Genesis chapter 37, verse 33 to 35. It talks about the fact that the father could not be consoled. And he said that, you know what, I go down into my grave to meet my son like this morning. So as far as Joseph is concerned, his son is dead. Agree? There's nothing anybody could tell him he, the son is dead. He's, I mean, he's got every evidence points to the fact that his son is dead, right? He's got the tunic that's been ripped apart. He's got the blood-stained tunic. There's nothing, there's nothing anybody could have told him, but guess what? The son is dead. And hence, in the natural, as far as he's concerned... I'm, I haven't got Joseph, my Joseph, my Joseph. But guess what? Me and you know, if only he had the eyes of the Spirit. But hey, that's not how it worked. So doesn't that remind us of a story? In about four or five days from now, we'll be celebrating the day Jesus was in the, after his meal, he was in the Garden of Gethsemane. After praying, they come and meet him and arrest him. And then take him to, to Caius' uh, Caius, uh, pa, palace or house. And then from there he goes to Pilate. Can you imagine the disciples? The moment they saw everybody coming, as far as they're concerned, this Jesus is as good as dead. Amen? They, there's no, it, listen, if, if Peter believed that, no, 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 don't worry, he'll go and come back in three days' time, he would not have denied him. So as far as Peter's concerned, Jesus is dead. He's as good as dead. It's just a matter of when you do the thing and let's, where do we go from here? Praise the Lord. So all the evidence in the natural might point in one direction. But ladies and gentlemen, in New Wine Church, the Spirit of God is saying different. Amen. Amen. And that is why it's important that we need the heart and the mind of the Spirit to recognize that in everything that God would do, there is a resurrection involved. Amen. When you come to Genesis chapter 45, verses 25 to 28, then it talks, it, the story changes. If you can put it on screen, please. Genesis chapter 45, 25, uh, 45, yeah, and 25 going forward. It says, then he came to, out of Egypt, 
and came to the land to Jacob, their father. This is the sons who have now left Egypt. They're going to see Jacob and tell him that Jacob is alive. Next. Next. And they told him, saying, Joseph is still alive. And he is governor of all the land of Egypt. And his heart stopped because he did not believe them. Listen. Do you realize what had happened there? They came to Joseph and, and to Jacob and said, listen, your son is not dead, he's alive. He's saying, what are you talking about? I saw the tunic. You guys gave me the tunic. I saw the blood. The blood was real. The tunic was torn. This guy is dead. The Bible says his heart stopped. And he did not believe it. Next. But when they told him all the things which Joseph had said to them, and when he saw the cards which Joseph had sent to carry him, the spirit of Jacob their father revived. I declare over New Wine Church, in this season of resurrection, ah, our spirit will be revived. Amen. Our church will be revived Amen. in the name of Jesus. Maybe there's a situation in your life. Guess what? This is a season for revival. Amen. Amen. In your body, revival. Amen. Praise the Lord. So you see that in this case, as far as he was concerned, Joseph was as good as he was. In fact, the brothers... When they thought they sold him, they thought the dream was dead. It was not, not the whole essence was selling, killing, trying to kill him or even sell him eventually was to kill the dream. But guess what? The God we serve is a God of revival. Amen. A God of resurrection. Amen. God resurrected that dream in the midst of the land. Ah, I declare, your dream will be resurrected. Everything that God has written concerning you because you are planted in his house will be resurrected. Yeah. Praise the Lord, somebody. Yeah. But doesn't that remind us of something else? When you come to the book of Luke chapter 24, verses 13 to 33, we read about the story of two disciples who were walking on their way to the town called Emmaus. And, 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 and a stranger joins them and they begin to talk to them. And eventually when Jesus reveals himself to be Jesus, didn't they say, they say in verse 33, verse 32 to themselves, and they said to one another, did not our hearts burn within us while he talked with us on the road and while he opened up the scriptures to us? Praise the Lord. Because Jesus said, Jesus revealed to himself, revealed himself to them that he was alive. I declare, something of God will burn in your heart in this season. The scriptures will come alive concerning your situation in this season. New Wine Church, I declare the Lord is reviving us. Amen. The Lord is taking us on a revival journey. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. So it's important for us to understand as chosen ones that God has chosen for a year of divine influence. That God has a plan and God has a purpose. God has a plan for your life. That which you are thinking of that is affecting you day to day, God has a plan for it. God didn't cause it to happen, but God is taking advantage of it. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. God is using it to work out his only divine purpose. Amen. So we see that God, because the reason why is that? Because Jesus himself, while he was in, on earth, in Mark chapter 12, verse 27, when they were talking to him about all this stuff about a marriage, when this one dies and that one dies, who takes over? And he said, listen, 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 listen. You, you totally got it wrong. For he is, is he, he is not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. So guess what? As long as there is a remnant like this in the household of New White Church, God is a God of the living. Amen. And listen, folks, you just get ready, get ready, get ready. You're going to see the resurrection power evident in this house in the name of Jesus because God is a God of the living amen and in Genesis chapter 42 46 chapter 46 the next chapter verses 2 and 4 Jacob is on his way to go and see his son and the Bible says that God spoke to Israel that's Jacob in a vision of the night and said Jacob Jacob and he said here I am next so he said, I am God, the God of your father. Do not fear to go down to Egypt, for I will make you a great nation there. Ah, New Wine Church. God is making us a great nation. Yeah. Every member of New Wine Church, God is making you a great person. Yeah. 
Ah, this is, this is a year of divine influence, right? So guess what? This is the year that you begin to wield your divine influence going forward. Because guess what? God says, do not be, I will make you a great nation. Let's go on, Let, verse 4. I will go down with you to Egypt. Guess what? We are not alone. You are not alone. I remember from the very start when Pastor Michael became senior pastor of this church. In fact, he, 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 he will say prophetically, God is with us. God is with us. Every so often. We haven't done now this way before. God is with us. You chose us. We don't know. We haven't got a scripture. God is with us. That's the word. Guess what? Because God is with us, we know God has a plan in this now moment. Praise the Lord, somebody. So it's important that we understand that God has a plan and a purpose. God said, I will go down there. We are not alone. Amen. New Wine Church, you are not alone. Amen. Members of New Wine Church, you are not alone. Amen. Because the God who is going with us is the one who will revive us. Amen. Hallelujah. So in that story, you see that Joseph's dream was meant to die. And they thought they killed it when they sold him into slavery while he was a slave and while he was in prison. But guess what? God revived. The Lord who revived. In the midst of the years, in the midst of the days, in the name of Jesus. So hey, in that story is coded resurrection already. Praise the Lord. The second one is found in the book of Second Kings, and you know the story already. Second Kings chapter six, verses one to seven. Exciting story. Let's put it on screen. Verse one. So the sons of the school, sons of the prophets, said to Elisha, "See now." The place where we dwell is for, uh, with you is too small for us. You see, one of the things that happens when God is ready to enlarge a people, when God is ready to start a move, there will be agitation. There will be a need to enlarge. There will be a need to say, Lord, where we are, we cannot be contained. We need to go to the nations to make your name great. We need to do this. We need to do that for you. Praise the Lord. And guess what? That's where we are as a people. Amen. He says, please let us go to the Jordan and let every man take a bee from there and let them make there a place where we may dwell. So he answered, go. The good thing about it is that, as I said, we've always said God is with us. We've never gone ahead to do anything. The man of God has always sought the sign and the face of God, the word of God, the, pan, the, the leading of the Lord. And God said, all right, go, do it. Amen. And these guys are wise people, just like New Wine Church. Let's go forward. Verse 3. Then one said, please consent to go with your servants. And he said, I will go. Remember what I said? The Lord is with us. God is with us. In even what we're going to, God is with us. Amen. And that's what it is for the people. We are not a people that are going to follow the fads out there. We're not a people that are just going to jump on the bandwagon. The Lord will lead us. Amen. Let's go out to next verse 4. So he went with them, and they came to the Jordan, and they cut the trees. Five. So they begin to do their work. But as one was cutting down a tree, the axe head fell into the water. And he cried out and said, Alas, master, for it was borrowed. Alas, master, for it was borrowed. In fact, remember, these are sons of the prophet. Chances are they don't have day jobs. This is just all they do. Studying the word, praying to the Lord, seeking the face of God. Here they are, they're about, is it possible that nearly everybody on the group was, was using a borrowed axe? Ah, you see, that's where, the, that's where the spirit comes in. When God is about his move, no borrowed vessel is allowed. It's got to be all God and God giving. Hallelujah. No borrowed testimony. <laughs> yes, somebody got it, somebody got it, somebody got it, somebody got it. No borrowed testimony. No borrowed revelation. That's where we are, New Wine Church. Because where we are going, the man said, alas, it was borrowed. God said, yeah, it's, it's borrowed. That's exactly what it is. It was borrowed. So guess what? He calls on the man of God. man of God said, where is it? He says, in there. He said, okay. Puts a stick, throws the stick in there. That stick represents the cross on which Christ. Hallelujah. What happened next? The iron head floated. Now, I did science, and you don't, even, you don't even need to do science. 
I mean, if you've, if, you've, if you've done any form of cooking, you know you pour rice, it, goes, it sinks to the bottom. Talk of rice, talking about the iron. So the ice sinks, you know what, you know what that means? There's nothing that can defy the move of God. There's nothing that we're going through. Hallelujah. Let's put our hands together properly for the Lord. Ah, throw it at us. The more the move of God will resurrect us. Hallelujah. So here you see, the iron that was thrown, the, 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 the stick, it floated. And so that the man knows that, that, that it was God doing it on their behalf, the man of God said, now, you, you pick it up yourself. Ah, I declare, no borrowed re revelation in your lives. You enter into a new revelation. Ah, isn't that part of the confession? The secret things of God belong to me. In this year, you will walk in that confession. Revelation knowledge is mine. Ah, you walk in that revelation knowledge in Jesus' name. That's what the divine influence is all about. Praise the Lord, somebody. So the man picks it up. But you know what? Think about us as human beings in the flesh. We always sink to the lowest denominator. Denominator. But guess what? When we receive the life of Christ on the inside of us, we rise up. Hallelujah. The new wine church, get ready, get ready, get ready. This is resurrection time. Hallelujah. So you see in two stories already, God has encoded the power of his resurrection. Praise the Lord. So that brings me to the foundation scripture that we found in Romans. Can we put Romans chapter 1 verse 3 and 4 on? Romans chapter 1 verses 3 and Concerning his son, our Lord Jesus, who was born of the seed of David according to the flesh. Verse 4. And declared. You know what? That declare doesn't do it justice. If you look at a strong dictionary, some would you designate it. Please put it back on. De designated. Designated still doesn't do it justice. Some will say determined. Does, determined doesn't do it. Go and look at the strong dictionary. The word in there is a Greek word called horizon. 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 Where we get the word horizon. Now you see where I started from. The horizon. God. Horizon his son. Hallelujah. Put him on the horizon. No ending to his breath. No ending to his height. No ending to his death. No ending to his life. Hallelujah. And he puts him on rising upon New Wine Church. And every time we look, all we see is the, unlim the unlimited supply. The bountiful supply of the spirit of Jesus. But how is that bountiful supply made available? Put it back on the screen, please. It is made available by the Spirit because of the resurrection. Amen. Amen. So guess what? As we begin to in, enter into this season, I need us to come into a place where resurrection power becomes two things. Not something we're looking forward to. No, 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 no. It's something that we enjoy objectively. Remember horizon. And when you're looking at Christ, say, where is the end of Christ? There is no end to Christ. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I'm victorious. But not only objective, but subjectively. When, the, when, we are not, when we're not depending on our natural senses, but now it's about our spirit made alive. Our spirit is now subject unto him. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. How can you do that? One, believe in the person of Christ. John 11, 25 says, I am the resurrection and the life. You do know that he said that before he was even arrested and killed. He was on the way to revive Lazarus. And he said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, yes, you might be looking like you're dying. Yes, you might even die. This, yes, they might write you off, but guess what? You will live. New Wine Church, you live. Members of New Wine Church, you live. Amen. So it's important that objectively we put Christ in our, front, in our front view. 
We see Christ. We hear Christ. We confess Christ. Jesus Christ, the resurrection. Jesus Christ, the life in every situation. Hallelujah. But not only that, we must come to a place where subjectively Christ has come alive. In Romans 1, chapter, in Romans chapter 1, verse 3 and 4, we talk about the fact that he was designated. He was horizon, put out there, that you cannot miss it. According to the spirit power of, in the holiness, through the resurrection of the dead. Christ died. He rose up. And guess what? We rose up with him. Amen. And hence, according to Paul, Paul will write in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6, he said that it is God, for it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness. Do you know what he's referring to there? Paul makes a throwback to Genesis chapter 1, where God saw that upon the face of the earth was darkness and voidness. Amen? And God said, you know, and his spirit could not, was hovering because he could not land. And God said, let there be. That is what Paul is saying, that when he received, the subjective power of Christ, the resurrected Christ, it changed everything. He said, listen, I was, so, I was so into my Judaism, but when I received Christ, I realized it was darkness. Amen. Because Christ, the resurrected one, was now shining in my heart as life. Praise the Lord, somebody. That's what it means. And he said, who has shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Paul says, I looked into the face of Jesus Christ. Knowing that Paul never saw Jesus Christ physically like this, like Peter would say he saw, but he saw Jesus Christ in vision, in the spirit. And he said, in the face of Jesus Christ, I walked away knowing that, oh, everything I'd learned up to now was rubbish, was darkness. You know what? The light of God that revives situations will revive us. Amen. You do know that, in fact, what we see in Genesis 1 is a type of resurrection. The face of the earth was desolate and void. But God said, let there be light. And as a result of the light, the first day light, things began to put into place. In fact, it gave rise to the fourth day light, which was for times and seasons and harvest. Praise the Lord. And I declare that same resurrected power, resurrection power becomes light in our midst, comes light in your heart. In fact, Peter will write it. He says that this light, that we have received a sure word of prophecy. Praise the Lord. And you should heed it, and we will do well to heed it as a light that shines in dark places until the day dawns and the morning star arises, saturates our heart. The resurrection is already on the inside of us. You've got to be convinced that subjectively the Spirit of God is on the inside of me. That is why it was say in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 that the first being became a living being, the first Adam became a living being, and the second one became a life-giving spirit. We have this resurrection spirit already. Amen. Paul will write in the next chapter, and he will say that if any man, in 2 Corinthians, Corinthians chapter 5, Verse 17, if any man be in Christ, operative phrase is be in Christ. As many of us who have received the Holy Spirit, we are already in So it's not a matter of when we be, we're already in Christ. He says we are a new creature, amen. You know what that really means? That the dictates that the people in the world are subject to, we are not subject to them even though we subject ourselves to them because we do not know better. But how does that come about? It comes about because of the resurrection. Christ resurrected, and now he lives on the inside of me, lives on the inside of you. He says, all things, the dictates of the old have gone away. Beyond, behold, all things have become new. 
Christ lives anew on the inside of us. In spite of what we're going through. Because this is working for us. Hallelujah. So it's important that we recognize that. But Paul says, in the face of Jesus Christ, and I begin to round up now, what does that mean, in the face of Jesus Christ? Because until you recognize that by faith, you are viewing Christ's face. Unless you recognize by faith that every time in the world, you're praying, you're meditating in the spirit, you're worshiping, you are in the face of Christ. And that face of Christ is transforming you. Just like Paul says, it transformed him. Revolutionize his life. Revolutionize his ministry. Ah, so let's go there. Revelations chapter 5. I must say, ladies and gentlemen, ever since we started this journey on divine influence, I have not read Revelations like I've read like this in this season. And I wonder why many brethren run away from it. Because even the beginning talks about the blessing that is based on reading this Revelation. In Revelation is an opening up of how, what God's moves are, what God's move is concerning the church, concerning his end time, and concerning his saints. In Revelation chapter 5, we read about one of those moves in the church. But to give you a bit of context, I want us to read Revelation chapter 1 first. In Revelation chapter 1, verses 4. Paul is writing, and he said, John is writing, sorry, I do apologize. John is writing, and he's writing to the seven churches which are in Asia. Now, at the time of this writing, to get a better understanding of what's going on in Revelation, if you read the Gospel of John and the three epistles that he writes, you recognize that the church is in, 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 this, in, in, in corruption. It's degraded. So why would Paul be right, having to declare, write Christ as not just a man, but talk, writing him as God? Because people were thinking there's no resurrection from the dead. You read that in his apostles. How, why would John have to talk about the fact that, you know what, he talks about the things that he has seen and tasted. And that is a fellowship that he wants them to be part of. The church is, was in disrepute. The church was in corruption. But guess what? In the midst of that, God raises up John to be a mender. And I believe one of the ministry of New Wine Church is to mend. Amen. Amen. God wants to us to mend. Amen. Amen. You just look around and you've got to ask yourself, really? Over behind, in front, they are adjacent. It's because God wants to mend something. Amen. Amen. We have a ministry that is lully seconded, second to none, that God has bestowed upon us. People, people come from far away and they talk about it. We're not boasting, we're boasting in Christ. Amen. Amen. So I want you to understand that our ministry is one of mending. And hence, this is why we are being raised up for this time of influence. Listen to verse 4 of chapter 1. John, the, um, to the seven churches, which are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is, who was, and is to come. From the seven spirits who are before his throne. And, somebody say and. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness. In fact, that word witness is, the proper word is martyr. The faithful martyr, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler over the kings of the earth. So let's go back over that. And I'll, how many people is Paul um, is John referring to in there? If you're in the first service, you're not allowed to say anything. How many people? Uh, for, for people here, it's only for the second service. How many people is John referring to in this in this salutation? How many say five? How many say two? How many say one? Okay, let's read it again. He says, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits who are before his throne and from Jesus, the faithful martyr, 
the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. So how many people do you reckon? Shout it out. One, three. Okay. I, three. My, by my counting, it's three. Let's go three. One who is, who was, and is to come. That refers to God, Jehovah. Amen? Because remember, what is Jehovah? I am. You know what that means? In the days of Moses, which was how many thousand years ago now? God was, I am. Now, today is the 15th, right? 25th. 25th, 25th of March. God is still. Now, in 50 years time, 60 years time, our children's children who will be ruling, who will be, who will be worshiping in New Wine Church across the globe, God will be. So that is the one who is, who was, and is to come. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. So we have every confidence of the resurrection. But he says, but not only that, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne. So God is sitting on the throne, and the Bible says, I'm from the seven spirits. Now, you might be mistaken and think that, oh, does that mean that now there's no longer just Holy Spirit, there's seven spirits? No. What that really is, when you read it in context, as you'll be seeing later on, that this is the intensified fold of the Spirit of God. The same Holy Spirit that is now operating in seven different functions. Praise the Lord. Intensified. Remember what I'm talking about. When Jesus was on the earth, before he left, he said, baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. By this time, the church is in degradation. The church is in full corruption. And we're in the age of the Spirit because Jesus is not about to come back a second time. So the order has changed. The order is the Father. And then the Spirit by which we realize which was the life that was in Christ. Amen. Because really, Christ is the firstborn from the dead. And we take, uh, that means if he's firstborn from the dead, that means he's produced other brethren. Amen. Me and you. So in the face of that degradation, there needs to be the spirit that comes to mend. Amen. That comes to revive. Amen. Praise the Lord. So we see here the father who, is to, who was and needs to come. We see the sevenfold intensified spirit of God operating in his manifold wisdom in, in intensified form. And then we see Lord Jesus. Praise the Lord. The one who was the first one to go ahead to die and rise and we are now dead and arousing in him. Praise the Lord. I say this because the sevenfold spirit of God becomes very important to see in the face of Jesus Christ. Now let's go to Revelation chapter 5, and this will be the closing part. And in, in chapter 5, verse 4, So I wept, because no one was found worthy to open and read the scroll, or to look at it. But one of the elders said to me, do not weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of? The lion of the tribe of? Remember what he says, the first thing that he says, the lion of the tribe of Judah, amen, has prevailed, and to, prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seven seals. Who did it? The lion of the tribe of Judah. Verse 6, and I looked. So now John, maybe he was bowing down, he looked up to look at the throne. Maybe he looked back, in other way, in whatever way, he looked. He said, I looked, and behold, in the midst of the throne, and of the four living creatures, and in the midst of the elders, stood a lamp, a lamb, a what? But the elders said, a li the lion of the tribe of Judah. Now it's become a lamb, amen. You know the reason why? The lion is there to protect, amen. The lion is the one that fights against the enemy. The lion is the reason why the enemy will never be able to acquire or achieve its desired end over New Wine Church. Because the lion of the tribe of Judah, amen, faces him, amen. But guess what? He says, a lamb stood as though it had been slain, having seven horns 
and seven eyes, which are the what? Seven spirits of God sent out into the earth. You see, when Christ faces us, the believer, he's not a lion. He's the lamb, dispenser of grace by his blood. Hallelujah, somebody. So we have nothing to fear. No wonder he says in Romans chapter 1, chapter 5, verse 1, now therefore we have peace with God. Hallelujah. We have peace with God because the lamb has been slain. He has brought us back with his blood. But what was the, how, what's the description of the face of this lion? He has seven horns and he has seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into the, all the earth. You see, when Christ looks at us with his, from his face as a lamb, what is happening? His intensified spirit shines into our hearts, shines into our situation, shines into our body, shines into our church, shines into your marriage, shines into your, 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 your business, shines into your ministry. The eyes of Christ, because he says this, this lamb, it has seven eyes. But guess what? It is the spirit, the seven same spirit of God that was in front of the throne. Now, that is a mystery. Don't ask me how it happens. But all I know is by faith, I receive it. Amen. Amen. So when I'm going through a situation, no wonder Jesus, the Bible says that for those who call upon his name, he's rich. Unto, I call on Lord Jesus. And what happens? I behold in the face of Jesus. And guess what? The intensified spirit of God washes over me. Revise me. I enjoy his grace. I experience his love. Because why? That is the objective. That is a subjective resurrection power. Praise the Lord. And as I close, what should we do? Remember how in the life of the people of the, the school and the, the prophets of old who lost the ark. Let us come to a place where we say, Lord Jesus, by your resurrection power, I receive fresh revelation. As I read your word, it opens afresh. As I pray to you, you minister to me afresh. As I behold Christ for who he is, I get a fresh resurrection that influences me for day-to-day -day living. Because really and truly, if the influence that God has spoken concerning us is divine, it has to come from him. And how else will it come? By us looking into the face of Jesus and the intensified spirit of Jesus, the life-giving spirit of Jesus comes upon us. And that is why we can say, according to 2 Corinthians chapter 15, thanks be to God. Why? Because if you look at the, the discourse in chapter 15, it starts off with the fact that Paul is writing and says, concerning the things we, you want me to address, you're saying that they, how, does, how does, is there a resurrection of the dead? And he said, listen, if there's no resurrection of the dead, then we, we've lost it. But he says, you know what? There is resurrection of the dead. Because that resurrection of the dead has become the life-giving spirit to us. And hence he's going to say, thanks be to God who gives us victory by that resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. In this season, I need you to know the resurrection power is yours. Not to behold, but to enjoy. Not to seek out for, but to just live it out. And I declare, just in the same way that the enemy thought they had killed Joseph's dream, but guess what? His dream was revived you will be revived in Jesus' name. We hope you have been blessed by this message today. For more details, visit our website, newwine.co.uk. You can email church at newwine.co.uk. Connect with us on Facebook at New Wine London or follow us on Twitter, also at New Wine London. New Wine Church, we are